Well, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invite to speak. I know we're both very excited to, to talk with you all today. Um, so Louisa and I will be giving a joint talk about a project that we have been collaborating on for several years now. And the title of our talk is Expanding the Human Gut Microbiome Atlas of Africa. So the human gut microbiome, as many of you are aware, is this complex community of trillions of microorganisms that all coexist in our gut. And this predominantly is comprised of bacteria and viruses, but also includes archaea and fungi. And collectively, these microbes encode over 100 times more genes than we encode in our genome. There's immense genetic diversity in the gut microbiome. And as such, these microbes are involved in several different functions related to our health and disease, including things like immune maturation and metabolism and protecting us against pathogens. And I really like this microscopy image that came out of the um, Tropini et al. paper from the Sonnenberg Lab at Stanford, where they took a cross section of some mouse intestine and did lots of staining so you can see and appreciate how closely connected we are to this microbial community. You can see in the bottom right here, these blue stained epithelial cells. These are our intestinal cells. There's that thick layer of mucus going diagonally across. And then you can see three major phyla of bacteria stained in different colors in the top left. And so microbes are constantly eating at this mucus, signaling across this, um, this barrier. We, um, and from our epithelial cells, are secreting different factors to sculpt those microbial communities. So this is a very intimate and closely connected relationship. And we've learned from several papers and studies over the past 15 or so years that the gut microbiome can be shaped by a number of different factors in our lives, from the food that we eat and the drugs that we take to how we were born, the kinds of uh, water and hygiene we have available to us, and just a multitude of other factors that fall under that umbrella of lifestyle. But in turn, the microbiome can also affect lots of aspects of our health, how we metabolize nutrients and drugs, how we get resistance to colonization from pathogens, or perhaps the gut microbiome can contain pathogens that cause infection. And then there's all sorts of data out there showing how the gut microbiome can signal to and stimulate our immune cells. So I'll start with just a few brief vignettes to show some of the very direct functional links between the gut microbiome and health. I think for many folks who are new to the microbiome field, they've seen a lot of the studies that show a case group and a control group and some differentially abundant bugs between conditions. But recent research, and especially in the past five years, we've seen some really beautiful causative links between gut bacteria and different health and disease states. So one that I'll highlight is a paper that came out in 2019, looking at how the microbiome can modulate drug metabolism. And so in this publication, the authors took around 75 common gut bacterial species and nearly 200 different commonly prescribed drugs. And they co-cultured all of these species with all of these different drugs to see how much the microbes can metabolize each of those different drugs. And so you can see in the heat map, any of the squares that are not black, so gray or white, are cases where a given bacterial species was able to break down a drug. And they did some beautiful functional characterization, which I'm showing here on the right, where they had seen that the microbe B theta can metabolize a drug that is commonly prescribed for hypertension. It's an oral calcium channel, uh, channel blocker. And so they cloned all of the elements of that B theta genome into E. coli, did all of these co-culturing experiments again, and found a particular region of the genome that under different promoter strengths was able to, in a dose-dependent way, metabolize that drug and lead to an increase in that uh, metabolic byproduct. So this has lots of implications for thinking about precision medicine and thinking about how the composition of different individuals' gut microbiomes can affect their responsiveness to um, different prescriptions that they are taking. Another very neat example is this one looking at PKS positive E. coli. So E. coli is one of the best known bacteria. It is a very common model organism, and it's a microbe that pretty much all of the, us on this call probably have in our guts. 
But there's lots of different strains of E. coli. And in this case, the authors were looking at a strain called PKS positive E. coli. So that's a E. coli that encodes a polyketide synthase. And that operon encodes a genotoxin called colobactin. And this genotoxin can cause DNA damage. And so what they saw when they co-cultured this PKS positive E. coli with intestinal organoid cells, they saw markers of DNA damage occurring in that co-culture that they didn't observe in their control. So that's PKS positive on the top left and their control on the top right. And farther, when they did this co-culture experiment and they sequenced the genomes of these um, intestinal organoid cells over this time course of co-culture, they were able to find this mutational signature that was being caused by this E. coli that corresponded to the most common mutational motif seen in actual colorectal cancer patients. So here, a very beautiful illustration of how specific bacteria and specific genes in these bacteria can be causing different human health outcomes, in this case, mutations that make someone prone to colorectal cancer. And then a final vignette that I'll share is one explanation of how gut microbiome therapeutics are already being used in a clinical, uh, in a clinical setting. So I'll talk about fecal microbiota transplants, which is actually the transplantation of a healthy individual's gut microbiome into a diseased individual. And FMTs were very recently approved, I believe just in the last year by the US Food and Drug Administration. They're most commonly used in the context of C. diff. So when a patient in the hospital has a very dysbiotic microbiome, perhaps because of immunosuppressants and a lot of antibiotic usage, this decimates the microbiome and makes it a prime opportunity for the pathogen C. diff to enter the gut and colonize. And so FMTs have been used in the context of restoring a healthy microbiome to C. diff patients so that healthy and commensal microbes can outcompete that bug. And like I said, this has recently been approved by the FDA, but there are a lot of dangers still associated with fecal microbiota transplants. They're used much more commonly now, but it's very hard to screen donors to identify every single organism that's present in the gut, every single gene that those organisms might have. And there has been two cases of individuals who received FMTs that had actually strains of E. coli or E. fecium, I believe, that were toxic and did cause very severe infection. And so this is why in, in our group, uh, we're very interested in studying microbiomes of different populations, of drilling down to microbial strains and not just taxonomic profiling so we can understand the function of a microbiome. Because as we've seen here and in the context of FMT and in the colobactin example, the same species of organism, just with a few changes in gene content, can make the difference between a commensal organism and one that's a pathogen. So hopefully this has given you a nice teaser of some causative links between the microbiome and medicine, the microbiome and health. And so now I'll change gears a little bit to talk about what the scope is of microbiome research on the African continent. So... In microbiome research, similar to a lot of different fields of science, most of the research takes place at the absolute extremes of lifestyle and resource access. So this map here is showing, um, it's showing a microbiome database that is the gold standard for us in the human gut microbiome field. And what we did to make this plot was we looked in this database, which is considered quite comprehensive, how many individuals are represented from around the world. And as you can see here, the US and China have thousands of individuals that contributed to this gut microbiome database. There's also lots of samples from Western Europe, from Canada, but you look at all of the representation from South America, from Africa, from South Asia, and there's almost no people present in this database, right? Note the log scale on this color scheme. We're talking about no, or maybe on the order of a few dozen individuals from, from the Southern hemisphere. And this is really a problem because we know that the gut microbiome varies on a global scale. There have been some limited studies that have looked at this. This is one from Stephanie Schnorr in 2014, where they compared the microbiome composition of Hansa hunter-gatherers in northern Tanzania to a group of adult Italians. And they saw when they looked at the composition, the microbial makeup of all of these gut microbiomes, so each column here is representing one individual and their composition, 
they saw there were some taxa like those highlighted in red here that were completely absent in the European population, right? So this is early evidence that the gut microbiome varies with geography. And this shouldn't surprise us based off of what we talked about earlier. Populations from low and middle income countries, which collectively represent 83% of the world, have huge differences in diet and drug access and lifestyle and all of these different factors that can affect composition. And they also have many different health outcomes, different burdens of infectious disease and non-communicable disease. And so this really does highlight this big gap in where we're seeing representation for gut microbiome studies. So this is part of what motivated what now has been a collaboration for almost 10 years between Stanford and Vitz to study gut microbiomes of African individuals. And so this is the current team involved in the project. It includes trainees from both the Stanford side and from the Vitz side, and is co-led by the two PIs pictured here in the bottom row, Ami Ba at Stanford and Scott Hazelhurst here at Vitz. And we all are we are all working as part of the AWIGEN consortium. And so this is a international consortium to understand genetic and environmental risk factors for disease in four African countries, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Kenya, and South Africa. And this is largely designed as a genomic study. They recruited across two phases around 12,000 individuals from these four countries, all older adults. This involved extensive field work, at-home visits by field workers, a lot of biobank collection, as you can see in the top right. And the two pictures in the bottom here show what's one of the really unique and important aspects of AWIGEN, which is the extensive community engagement that was part of the study, both talking to community advisory groups prior to the beginning of the study, and also meeting with community members upon completion to give results back to members of the community. So the AWIGEN microbiome project was a subset of the overall AWIGEN genomic study. We recruited around 1,800 adult women from the six study sites across four countries, so one site each in Burkina Faso, Ghana, and Kenya, and then three different sites in South Africa. This was a cross-sectional study, so we randomly selected uh, women who met our inclusion criteria at each of the study sites, which was very nice because it gives us a much more accurate picture of the breadth of the population, which really stands in contrast to how most microbiome studies are conducted in high-income countries or how my lab might conduct a study at Stanford, where you walk over to the affiliated university hospital and you recruit patients as they walk in the door. So this is a population representative study. And on top of having microbiome data, we also have blood and urine biomarkers. We have uh, human genome SNP panels, lots of anthropometric measurements, and just these very extensive lifestyle and health history surveys as well. So I'll show you a few pictures of the study site so you can get a bit of a grasp on how broadly the AWIGEN study is capturing. So we sampled from two study sites in West Africa, Nanoro, Burkina Faso, and Navrongo, Ghana, which are both much more rural, much more low de population density, where subsistence in these two sites is largely through subsistence farming and small-scale livestock keeping. We also sample from two uh, areas with rural villages in South Africa. This is a picture of the Damamo Health and Demographic Surveillance Site in Limpopo. We also sample from the Agincourt Health and Demographic Surveillance Site in Pumalanga. And these are also considered rural, but rapidly industrializing, right, with much more access to processed foods and fatty foods um, and much less subsistence agriculture than what, what, uh, what one might see in the West African sites. And then we also sampled from very urban environments. One of our study sites is in Soweto, just outside of Johannesburg. But we also sampled from two informal settlements in Nairobi, Kenya, Korogosho and Vewandani, where the population density is extremely high, access to clean water is extremely low, and employment is much more, you know, gig work, circulatory migration, et cetera. And so this is one of the things that I think is very strong about the AWIGEN study is that we're sampling from what could be considered maybe three or four very different kinds of environments of lifestyles, of income, of nutrition that span a huge range, 
which stands in huge contrast to the much more uh, homogeneous sampling that's done in most of the studies that you saw in that original map that we showed. So the first thing that we asked after we did all of our sampling for AWIGEN was this first order question of how does the gut microbiome differ across African populations? And so to, to give you a little bit of a picture into how we study this, this is usually our workflow, right? We collect samples from our participants, of course. We extract DNA from those samples. We fragment that DNA into millions of pieces and perform shotgun sequencing. So this is whole gut microbiome metagenomic sequencing rather than amplicon sequencing where people are just studying a specific gene that all bacteria have. And then we take all of those reads, we align them to reference genomes in databases, and that gives us a relative abundance of different organisms for each individual. And so once we did this for all of our samples, the first thing that we looked at was diversity of the microbiome, because diversity is sort of a catch-all term that we usually associate with microbiome health. If you have a more diverse microbiome, that usually means you're getting a more diverse um, sampling of fruits and vegetables and fiber sources, and usually less diverse microbiomes are associated with different inflammatory disease states. And so here I'm showing the bacterial richness across all of our samples. So this is the number of different species that every individual had. And you can see all the individuals here are in these gray points with summary statistics in the box plots. And so when we first looked at bacterial richness, we saw this really interesting gradient where richness was higher in Nanoro and Nefrongo. Those are our West African populations. And richness decreases along that industrialization axis. So it's lower in Dimamo and Bushbuck Ridge. Those are the rural South African sites. It's lowest in Soweto, just outside of Johannesburg. Something that we thought was interesting here, because that observation was somewhat expected for us, but something that I was certainly surprised by when we first, uh, first saw this figure was that richness in Nairobi was a little bit more intermediate. And as you'll recall, Nairobi is the highest density, most urban population that we sample from. But what we see here is that it looks a little bit more intermediate. And this starts to give us some insight into the demographics and the lifestyle of individuals living in those two informal settlements, right? They might practice more migration between where they are in Nairobi and rural villages. They might have more recently migrated. They might be retaining diets that are a little bit more similar to what, um, what individuals in Nanoro and Navrongo are eating. But we can also look at which taxa are differing across sites. And one way we can do this is by looking at their prevalence. So this is what portion of a population has that taxon. So between zero and one. And so in this plot, what we're seeing is uh, several hundred bacterial species, and that's every very skinny vertical column. And those species prevalence across the six study sites, which are the six rows. And the prevalence is indicated in that grayscale where darker squares are those taxa that are more common in an individual study site. And what we see here is that there's taxa that follow different prevalence patterns. So all the way on the right-hand side of this heat map, we see taxa that are universally prevalent. Nearly everybody has them in all six sites. So we can start to think about these as the core microbiome of the Awigen population. Everybody has these. Everyone on this call probably has these. These are very universal taxa. But when we look more at the middle of the heat map, we see that there are some taxa that are being lost with that industrialization axis. They're very common in Nonora and Navrongo at the top of the plot, but they start to disappear as we move towards Soweto. In the left-hand panel, we see taxa that have the opposite pattern. These are the microbes that seem to be gained with industrialization because they're most common in Soweto. And we can pull out bugs that are most interesting to us. So here's two very contrasting examples. One on the left is treponema. Um, and we can see for treponema, we can look at its abundance across the site. So how much treponema do different individuals have? And we see that in Nanoro and Navrongo, treponema is quite abundant, but it's almost completely absent in all of the other study sites. This is a bug that gets lost with industrialization. Maybe it's sensitive to antibiotics, for example. And then we see taxa that seem to be gained with industrialization here on the right, where we have that beautiful, very clear gradient 
with increasing abundance. So maybe this is a taxon that is much more um, able to persist with a fatty food diet. Maybe it is more antibiotic resistant. Maybe it is a little bit aero tolerant and it can exist in guts that have a little bit more oxygen, which is common with, with um, inflammatory disease, with obesity, et cetera. And so we can start to pull different patterns out of all of these taxa and start to understand these disease signatures a little bit better. But my, my pet interest, and as my intro alluded to, I'm someone who cares a lot about microbial genomes and assembling microbial genomes, was understanding the novel microbial diversity that exists in these microbiomes. And as we saw from that original map, African genomes are, or African microbiomes are massively underrepresented in gut microbiome research. But we could hypothesize that because there's so many different lifestyles and exposures, there's probably also new microbes in African guts. And so we had talked before about this, this technique that we use to study microbiome composition. But when we're interested in studying new microbes, we can't use these same methods. We can't take reads and map them to a database if we're looking for organisms that aren't in databases. So what we do instead is we assemble the genomes de novo. And so instead of calculating relative abundance, we take our reads and assemble them. So we overlap the reads to build contigs or contiguous sequences. And then we group those contigs into draft genomes. And so basically we are taking contigs that look similar to each other. Maybe they have similar abundance. Maybe they have similar GC content or tetranucleotide frequency. And we group them into putative genomes and then run some QC on those. And when we do that for this study, for all of the participants in the microbiome project, we uncover on the order of, I think what ended up being around 80,000 bacterial genomes which we can then dereplicate, right? Because some people are going to have the same genome. So we get this unified set of around 3,000 bacterial genomes. And when we compare these to existing catalogs, we find that over a thousand of these genomes are new, right? So they're representing new species or new strains of microbes that have not been seen prior, which is very cool because a thousand genomes is a lot of microbial diversity that we in the field have not seen before. And as you can see from this plot here, where we're showing the phylogeny of these genomes in the center, that inner ring is showing that these genomes come from 19 different bacterial phyla. So it's not just in one phylum that's been underrepresented, but across the bacterial tree of life. And what, what we see here, because at this point I was curious and our team was curious, have we found everything there is to find? If we sequence another 2,000 people, are we going to continue to find novel taxa? And the answer is no, we have not saturated microbial discovery. We can look and make rarefaction curves across our participant pool and see how many new genomes for bacteria or for viruses or new proteins we're finding per individual. And we see that we really haven't plateaued. As we look at more and more individuals, we haven't hit that asymptotic line. And we're seeing, especially for bacterial proteins and for viruses, that there's a lot more novelty to be discovered. But with that, that is the characterization of these microbiomes. So I will pass this off to Louisa to talk about some of the disease associations that we did. Uh, thank you very much, Dylan, uh, for that introduction and just walking us through um, how the gut microbiome differs across the African population and uh, just the novelty that exists in this uh, African microbiome. And uh, Dylan also mentioned as well that um, through Awigen, we have this immense wealth of lifestyle and health history data that was collected from these, all these participants. And therefore, apart from the descriptive and novelty in the African microbiome, uh, we can also look at how the gut microbiome relates to disease and uh, the severity. Next. So just recently, we had infectious diseases were the most talked about in the Sub-Saharan African uh, continent. But don't get me wrong, they still are. But we recently seen a change in tide uh, to more of uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. But HIV is still the most uh, top three infectious diseases of public health concern, including TB and malaria. And uh, one of the greatest burden in Sub-Saharan Africa is within the Eastern and Southern uh, Africa. 
But one thing we have to acknowledge is that there's been an increase in the uptake of antiretroviral therapy over the years with a subsequent aversion of AIDS-related death. And because of the high prevalence of HIV in South Af Southern Africa and in Kenya, we were able to look at HIV and the gut mic microbiome because we had the numbers to look at this. Next. And uh, the other reason was because of uh, more uh, biological reasons that we might think of the association between the gut microbiome and the relationship it has with the HIV infection. One of the reasons is being that HIV is a disease of the gut, which is a concept that is very easy to lose sight of uh, with all the attention that is paid towards the sexual transmission and the blood measurements of uh, this virus. And secondly, because the gut, which is the uh, uh, most densely populated body site with the CD4 T cell receptors, and the gut-associated lymphoid tissues serves as one of the strongest reservoirs for this HIV virus. And so the, therefore it can still uh, be able to integrate into the cells in our um, gut system. And thirdly, we know that uh, during HIV infection, there's a damage to the epithelial barrier and this affects the integrity. Therefore, one of the things that is affected, uh, 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 that uh, we see after the barrier is affected is that translocation uh, of uh, microbes across the epithelium, and they're able to get into our, our bloodstream and cause this inflammation, and yet they are actually typically supposed to be able to protect us against um, uh, microbes, which the, the, the mucus layer that uh, Dylan showed us in that beautiful microscopic um, image at the beginning. And the other thing uh, why we were interested in uh, looking at HIV in this cohort is we know that uh, antiretroviral therapy is just not sufficient uh, for gut remediation, and this has been shown in other studies, so we wanted to look at it in this study. Next. <clears throat> so as mentioned before, a normal gut has these microbes uh, that is able to maintain the, the stability of the membrane, and therefore it does this by producing certain metabolites, such as the short-chain uh, fatty acid and butyrate, and that therefore prevents the microbial expansion. But if, they, uh, if there's the dysbiosis that has happened, then these specific microbes are able to overgrow. And then the changes in the metabolites that happen uh, with the absence of very specific species that would have taken up these metabolites leads to an increased uh, production of these pro-inflammatory cytokine cytos, uh, the IL-6, IL-17, and uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. And these are also uh, inflammatory cytokines. So, but there have been several studies that have been done um, to understand that interplay in HIV and the gut microbiome. And a majority have looked at uh, a reduction, have reported a reduction in alpha diversity in the HIV cohort and an increased prevotella and so on and so forth. Next. So within our origin, microbiome study, we looked at a subset of the individuals with the HIV data that we had, and those were participants from uh, Bush Park Ridge. We had Soweto and Nairobi. We had to drop out the other two participants, uh, two study sites, because uh, the West African uh, study sites had a low prevalence of HIV, so they were not included in this subset analysis um, that we looked at. So we had around, roughly about 120 uh, people living with HIV, in this data set and about 800 plus um, HIV uh, negative individuals. Uh, that is the figure to my left. And we were able to compare the microbiome composition in this subset of uh, the cohort in terms of their diversity, uh, which is the figure on uh, my right. So we looked at all the participants combined, which is the first um, the first two, and then now looking at uh, by site. And what we identified is the individuals who are HIV negative uh, had a much higher uh, microbial richness than individuals who are HIV uh, are positive or people living with HIV, which is the blue figure, which is the blue bar. And, and that was uh, consistent across the, the three sites and as um, as a whole uh, with the two sites, uh, with the three sites together. And uh, we, we see that across all these three sites, um, individuals with HIV have actually lost some microbes um, and some of them are probably missing, but Nairobi had a slightly higher uh, diversity com when compared to uh, Bushback region, so right, so next. And what we can do from here is actually identify specifically 
which ones of these taxes have been, uh, which have been lost, which ones are they? So this is actually a heat map that is displaying some of the study sites, the three study sites that we looked at. Uh, from my left, we have Bush Park Ridge, Soweto and Nairobi. And, but we can also see uh, what we identified from this um, um, heat map is uh, we, had, we were able to see some of the microbial sig signatures, which are similar to what has been described in other populations. But we also see that the uh, microbes are, are, uh, which are increased in the people living with HIV, which is their red upper bar, and, uh, and which microbes are lost, which is in the blue uh, lower bar. And each row is what is representative of uh, microbial species. And what stood up is, as, as Dylan was showing us, is this yellow. And uh, we have one of them is the fusion bacteria, which comes up and, and it's a non-inflammatory microbe. And it's been shown in other studies, the uh, cardiometabolic association, inflammatory diseases, and as well as in some of the HIV studies uh, of uh, um, to be a pro-inflammatory microbe. Uh, but uh, within the depleted species, which is the blue side, uh, we see fecalibacterium uh, showing up, which is the first one, uh, the first and the third and fourth. Uh, and it's it's a microbe that is known to uh, to decrease inflammation. And, and uh, what uh, other microbes specialists will agree with me is this, this frustration that we all face when you identify all these species or these uh, statistically significant taxa and you go and find there's no information um, uh, on them. And that is what we first, and these were the four different, uh, the ones in red, were the four different species that we found um, and had not been described in the context of the human gut microbiome ever. And uh, we also specifically focused on this in terms of the HIV and uh, in the US and the European, where majority of these studies have been done, um, microbiome studies have been done, and we do not see of, uh, these microbes in, the, in any of the human gut microbiome, but these have uh, been identified in other studies such as the in the environmental section and uh, the livestock arena. And so this is just one of the four examples to just show um, uh, that uh, H with HIV infection, what is lost, what is gained um, in this arena. And it's a great illustration of why we need such studies to be done in the African or in these communities, our uh, these cohorts, and so that we can identify those uh, different species or different taxa, which have not been identified before. Next. So Dylan has already touched on uh, precision medicine in the gut microbiome and uh, disease uh, and health space. However, this uh, translation to um, uh, improve health will only make sense if we are able to understand the mechanism of the association, associated microbes and describe them in this HIV space through culturing and more functional characterization. And then we can have therapeutic avenues. And once we have understood uh, all these causal relationships, then we can translate these and be able to improve their uh, health. So as previously mentioned, we, we talk about the microbiome best therapy and our minds always shift towards uh, the probiotics except for the fecal matter transplant that Dylan has already highlighted, such as in the DC, uh, C. Difficile, difficile space. And this option is also being explored in the, um, uh, for its potential benefits in the HIV to identify which uh, microbes are beneficial to explore the postbiotic aspect or the detrimental microbes and which one could generate those small uh, molecule inhibitors that are able to stop um, microbes from making this metabolite. So all in all, we still have a long way to go, but we all need these large microbiome studies and multi-omics to be able to address this. Next. So I'll just conclude uh, by just summarizing some of the big contributions uh, this study has made. It represents uh, one of the largest population uh, representative done on the African continent through a large cross-sectional enrollment uh, from different study communities. And it's able to it was able to piggy bank on the existing uh, health demographic and uh, survey systems to collect more population-based data and a massive, um, uh, intense uh, health and um, uh, lifestyle information from these participants. And uh, we've also identified an extensive microbial novelty and microbiome signatures of HIV, which are now able, we are now able to expand on the human gut microbiome atlas of Africa. Next. <clears throat> I would like to thank the National Institute of Health Funding Agencies 
besides uh, that uh, Dimamo, Nairobi, Soweto, Navirongo, and uh, Nanoro, um, for all their contributions, and each one of the researchers from the University of Witwatersrand Rand and Stanford team. And uh, I will welcome any questions. Thank you. <laughs> 